All right, everybody, welcome again to another edition of Art Brunch, where we explore the wisdom of the arts, spirituality, and the great ideas. I'm very happy that you decided to join me on this Easter Sunday. Uh, we don't have as quite as big of a crowd as we normally have, but that's okay, I understand. Also, just in case you want to support this mission of mine, you can go to this site, pinestreetchurch.net, click on Give in the top bar, menu bar, and then you'll be brought to this page. Under select a fund, select off Broadway arts. That's not only supports our brunch, it supports our concerts that we do throughout the year, uh, special programming. We have a big uh, Broadway musical, off Broadway musical, uh, and also supports our curated art events. So if you'd like to continue to support us financially, that would be wonderful. <clears throat> All right, we continue our series, Art and Country. We started part one of Japan last week, and we're going to continue with Japan and the classical Edo period. This period is also known as the Tokugawa period, which lasted from 1603 to 1868. So that's 265 years. So it lasted quite a while. But in 1868, imperial rule was reinstated in Japan, and that marks the end of the Edo period. Uh, the period is also known as an era of economic growth and strict social order. There were isolationist foreign policies, a stable population. There was perpetual peace during this time. Uh, they had just gotten out of a civil war and uh, experienced a long period of peace. And there was widespread popular enjoyment of arts and culture. And we're going to look at some of that art right now. <clears throat> One of the most popular styles in the earliest phase of the Edo period were screens, which used gold or silver backdrops. A popular subject for screens were portrayals of the arrival of Westerners in Japan following the import of guns in 1543. In those days, Westerners, mainly Spanish and Portuguese, were referred to as, quote, Southern barbarians. This type of screen is known as Namban Biobu, which literally translates to Southern Barbarian Screens. Now, in this scene that you're seeing, we have a procession of Westerners sort of going diagonally across the middle there. Notice their hats. Those are not Japanese hats. Now, look around the screen for a moment, and you will notice the numerous curious gazes at these foreigners. There are three women dressed in exotic Chinese robes shown walking ahead of the crew, however. I think they might be escorting them, giving them a tour, but this actually would have been historical fiction uh, because no woman, European or otherwise, would have been present at a procession like this. Now look at the very top right corner. Very top corner, you'll see two men in black robes and one in a brown robe. These are most likely Jesuit or Franciscan missionaries. And the building that they're standing in front of is a church. Here's another Nanban screen. This particular screen is very brightly colored, might be easier for you to see. Judging from the style, this work has been attributed to a great artist of the period, Kano Sanraku an early master of this art form. The left screen depicts a large merchant vessel arriving at a port with sails lowered, while the right screen represents the procession of the ship's captain and his crew through the main street of the port town and the greeting they receive from a group of missionaries near the entrance to a Christian church. Here you see those group of monks, probably Jesuits because they're in black, and they are assembled to greet these Western merchants. Now, this is pure colonialism. <laughs> there are some dark-skinned members of the crew also depicted in this painting. Now, the Edo period, as I mentioned before, is known for its animosity toward foreigners and their religion, their foreign religion, including Christianity. So screens such as these express a touch of xenophobia. The flourishing of Neo-Confucianism was the major intellectual development of the Edo period. Confucian studies up to this point had long been kept active in Japan by Buddhist clerics. 
But during the Edo period, Confucianism emerged from Buddhist religious control. Neo-Confucianism was a philosophical system which emphasized a more secular view of humanity and society. It's very intellectual. This gentleman right here is Fujiwara Seika. He was one of the major pioneers of Neo-Confucianism in Japan. Now, this philosophy can be characterized as humanistic, rationalistic, with the belief that the universe could be understood through human reason. It's like the Renaissance in that way. And that it was up to people to create a harmonious relationship between the universe and the individual. The ethical humanism, rationalism, and historical perspective of Neo-Confucian doctrine appealed to the official class. Study of the natural world was important. So was the study of Japanese ancient culture. It's a point of emphasis, including its ancient mythologies associated with the Shinto religion. Now here's another screen by Kano Sanraku expressing some of these mythical elements in Japanese philosophy. The dragon, you see on the right there, and the tiger are opposing yet complementary forces within Japanese mythology. Together, they represent the yin and the yang of the universe. They are often shown flanking paintings of a Buddhist deity. Such pairing of opposites was popular within Zen Buddhism and art that was influenced by Buddhism. Now, Buddhism and Shinto were both still important in Tokugawa or Edo, Japan. Buddhism, together with Neo-Confucianism, provided standards of social behavior. And although Buddhism was not as politically powerful as it had been in the past, Buddhism continued to be espoused by the upper classes. And prescriptions against Christianity at this time benefited Buddhism. The rigid separation of Edo society into regions and villages, wards and households, strengthened attachments to the ancient Shinto faith among the regular folk. Shinto provided spiritual support to the political order and was an important tie between the individual and the community. Shinto also helped preserve a sense of national identity. Now, Shinto literally means the way of the gods, and it's Japan's native belief system, and it predates historical records. It's very ancient. Now, Shinto eventually assumed an intellectual form under the influence of Neo-Confucian rationalism and materialism. In the field of art, the Rinpa school became popular. The paintings and crafts of the Rinpa school are characterized by highly decorative and showy designs using gold and silver leaves, bold compositions with simplified objects to be drawn, repeated patterns, and a playful spirit. This work you're looking at right now is by a Renpa master named Tawaraya, Wind God and Thunder God. It's a pair of two folded screens made using ink and color on gold foiled paper. Now the work depicts Reijin, the god of lightning, thunder, and storms in the Shinto religion, and in Japanese mythology, and also represents Fujin, the god of wind. Now, this was a very popular depiction, and so it was actually copied by several artists. Here is another version of it. This was made by Tawairaya's disciple and also a Renpa virtuoso named Ogata Koren. I'm going to be showing you a few Ogata Koren works right now. Look at this extraordinary work. Ogata Cohen was also interested in depicting the natural world, a big emphasis of Neo-Confucianism. On the left screen, a plum tree with white blossoms. On the right screen, a plum tree with red blossoms. But what really stands out is this flowing river-like form right down the middle. The Japanese culture, rip, rivers represent the life force of the universe. Now, despite the simplified, even stark depictions of the tree forms, one gets a sense of the spiritual vitality and aliveness of the landscape. Here is another painting of the natural world by Ogata Koren, a beautiful depiction of irises. 
Notice the simplicity in style coupled with the dazzling color. Now this screen is paired with another screen of viruses, this one. I'd like you to just take a moment to marvel at the composition, the way the artist chose to depict these irises. All right, let's move on. Forces of nature were always popular subjects for these artists because they mirrored ancient beliefs and spiritual forces at play in the real world. You can't help but feel the tremendous power of the waves in this painting. And notice how the clouds are depicted, just like the powerful waves, but in the sky. This work is overflowing, and pardon the pun there, overflowing with energy. Can you feel it? Another master artist from the Rinpa school who focused on the natural world was Sakai Hotsu. Notice how the river on the left seems suspended in the golden space. It also seems to abruptly disappear. It's almost supernatural in how the artist depicts it. On this screen, Hoitsu has chosen a silver backdrop instead of gold. Notice again the river seemingly suspended in space. Such rivers act as symbols for spiritual realities in the natural world. Now, I love these next two screens. This one of a cherry tree with white blossoms. Why do you think Hoitsu loved depicting trees so much? Well, notice for one, their shape. They are not tall and straight, but roughly curved. Let's take a look at the other screen paired with this one. Two maple trees at the peak of their crimson glory. Also, notice how there is hardly any landscape in the background to offer any sense of depth, perspective. It's very flat. I think this lends a kind of poetic significance to the tree. I think Hoitsu's trees reflect something of the inner experience of the artist. And now, as Monty Python would say, now for something completely different. Craftsmanship and other art forms became popular during the Edo period. Due to the end of a period of civil war and the development of the economy, many crafts with high artistic value were produced. Among the samurai class, arms came to be treated like works of art. And unlike European armor, Edo period armor was very ornate. As were Japanese swords and their hilts, mountings and their armor beautifully decorated with lacquer and metal carvings. These all became popular. And each region in Japan encouraged the production of crafts to improve their finances. Disposable income began spreading more broadly in society, and they could actually afford items like this to commission them. For the first time, urban populations had the means and leisure time to support a new mass culture. Their search for enjoyment became known as 
ukiyo, which means the floating world, known for the discovery and enhanced appreciation of aesthetic qualities and objects and actions of everyday life. Now let's move ahead to the 19th century and an art making method most of us associate with the Japanese. Wood block prints like this one are made by transferring an image carved on a block of wood onto a sheet of paper. Japanese woodblock printmaking is known for its innovative use of materials. The first and one of the most important steps for the artist is selecting the proper wood. Traditional Japanese printmakers integrate the grains of wood into the design. After the woodblock is selected, the surface is cut away with knives or gouges, varying in size to accommodate different thicknesses of lines. And next, ink is applied to the surface with brushes, and then a piece of paper is placed over the colored block. The back of the paper is rubbed with a baron or a disc-shaped pad. And the areas of the wood block that are cut away will remain blank on the paper. As you can imagine, this technique is labor intensive. Just look at the details on that bird. I'll take a moment with this extraordinary work. A lively waterfall dominates this famous work by printmaker Katsushika Hakusai. The print is from a series by the artist called A Tour of Waterfalls of Various Provinces. Kirifuri Waterfall was a popular site to visit during Hakusai's time and still is today. Strong white and blue vertical lines pour down from the top of the waterfall, dividing and spreading wider at the bottom like the roots of a tree. Three male travelers in front of the waterfall look up, mesmerized by the beauty and scale of the surging water. Above and to the right, two more figures look down at the scene from a higher point on the hill. Well-balanced colors of blue, green, yellow, orange, and white bring together many elements in the print. The importation of mineral pigments from Europe in the 19th century, especially Prussian blue, gave Japanese landscape printmakers like Hakusai new opportunities to express dramatic effects of sky and water. Hakusai carefully plays with warm and cool colors, creating contrast between rock, water, and earth. Probably the most famous series of paintings Hakusai produced was 36 views of Mount Fuji. For the Japanese, Mount Fuji symbolizes purity, perseverance, and eternity. Its steep slopes and snowy peaks inspire respect and contemplation. In, in Japanese culture, the mountain is often associated with meditation and the search for spiritual enlightenment. Now, prints like these are known as ukiyo-e. Ukiyo-e printmaking was a primary part of the wave of Japanese that swept Western art in the late 19th century, especially in Europe among the Impressionists and Post-Impressionists. Now, this print may be the most famous of the Edo period, the Great Wave of Kanagawa by Hakusai. The breathtaking composition of this woodblock print, said to have inspired Debussy's La Mer, the sea, ensures its reputation as an icon of world art. Hakusai cleverly played with perspective to make Mount Fuji appear as a small, little triangular mound within the hollow of the cresting wave. The artist became famous for his landscapes, creating using a palette of indigo and imported Prussian blue that you see here. And by the way, notice the boats. You see those long canoe-like boats, kayak-like boats swept up in the waves? Don't see any human beings on them. <laughs> it's a little frightening. This next work is from a series with the beautiful title, 
Oceans of wisdom. Oceans of wisdom. The series, which features scenes of fishing, including shellfish gathering, whaling, and fly fishing, allow Hakusai to explore one of his favorite themes, that of man expressing himself through labor and harmoniously working with the forces of nature. This is particularly evident in the print Choshi in Shimosa province, which shows fishing boats struggling in a stormy sea, echoing his roughly contemporaneous The Great Wave off Kanagawa. Now, to be honest with you, I think I might like this print more than The Great Wave. What do you think? Here are two fishing scenes from the Oceans of Wisdom series. Now the title of the series can be read in two ways, I discovered. The Japanese characters read as, quote, 1,000 pictures of the ocean. But when read aloud, the title sounds like the Japanese words for Oceans of Wisdom. Now I don't know Japanese, so I'm gonna take the museum site where I learned this at face value. Notice the artist's penchant for this dramatic blue. The Plum Garden at Kamido is one of Utagawa Hiroshiga's most recognizable designs. You may have heard of this artist as well. It's recognizable because it was famously copied by Vincent van Gogh in 1887. It stands out from other works of the time due to its innovative composition, an extreme close-up of the tree, as well as unexpected colors, especially the reddish sky. And notice once again, we have an artist who prefers trees whose shape jig jags across the surface of the paper. This next work, I want you to take a little bit more time with. It's quite an extraordinary composition. Notice the title of this work. Now, looking at it, it almost looks completely abstract. It is certainly a very unusual composition. It almost reminds me of haiku poetry in its simple profundity. And maybe that poetic form influenced Hiroshiga. But what do you think of it? Take a moment with this work before I move on. The Hakone Pass is a famous place for adventurous hikers and travelers. It boasts splendid scenery. One could look out from the pass over the clear waters of Lake Ashi toward Mount Fuji's peak and the Hakone Shrine in a dark forest. The steep, narrow mountain path pictured here allows us a view of a long procession. This print demonstrates Hiroshigas' genius in translating nature into a dramatic composition. Now, another work from the series 36 Views of Mount Fuji. Futami Bay's wetted rocks are two offshore standing stones symbolically linked with thick rope. Now, you can't see the space between the larger rock and the middle and the one just to the right, but there are ropes kind of connecting them. Do you see that? They're actually separate rock uh, forms. For Shintoists, the rocks represent Inzanagi and in Izanami, the gods who raised Japan from the sea, gave birth to it. They stood on the floating bridge between heaven and earth, sort of like Jacob's Ladder, 
and created the land from the sea with a jeweled spear. Then the bridge that they were standing upon fell to earth to create a narrow pine-covered isthmus near Kyoto, Japan. Now the married rocks, the larger one considered male and the smaller one female, symbolize the union of the creator gods and thereby also represent the union of marriage. The craggy rocky formations are separated by the churning waves along the shore during high tide, but joined in Shinto ceremonies by heavy rice straw ropes known as Shimanawa. Did you see those ropes tying the two rocks together? Now also notice at the top of the male rock, the larger rock, is a small Tori gate designated the rock's peak as a sacred space. Now look at the bottom of the large rock. It looks like a red chair. This is also a Tori depicted by Hiroshige at the base, but it's a bit of a mystery. What does it symbolize? Many art critics, I'd look this up, still don't know what it signifies. Maybe you have an idea, I don't. But watching over all of this from the distance is Mount Fuji. Now I'd like to close with this Hiroshiga work, Evening Glow. The great mountain is half concealed in the misty yellow light of dusk. The blue of the water contrasts perfectly with the yellow sky. Fishermen's boats dot the entire work while there is a deep serenity expressed. Do you feel that? Now today is Easter, and I know that this work, first of all, does not come from a Christian artist, and also it depicts a sunset, not a sunrise, but the brilliance of the light and the mysterious quality of the work, particularly of the distant mountain, remind me of the glorious mystery of the Easter event, at least the spirit of this day. What feelings, what thoughts does this work evoke in you? With that question, I'd like to open up the floor to any comments. Please remember to unmute yourself and then mute yourself back when you're done. The floor is now open. 